Stephen Elabo. Welcome me to Deeper Life Bible Church Ministry, Charlottesville, United States. It is our belief that you will listen to our general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumuyi, and other ministers of God from our ministry, and they are sharing the mind of God with you and your family. God bless you and remain blessed. You are coming for the first time. We welcome you. And I pray that this day will be a renewal, restoring, revival day in your life in Jesus' name. We come to talk on something essential, something important, something indispensable, which not everybody is thinking about. Perhaps in kingdom, in Christendom. That is, in the Christian world in general. Nobody is thinking about what we are talking about today, and nobody is pursuing, and nobody is praying, and nobody is planning to even have this fulfilled in their lives. But the Word of God remains the same, and we want to find out why are we here? Why do we come to the Lord's house? Why do we hear preaching? Why do we pray? Why do we seek the face of the Lord? What's the goal? What's the purpose? What do we want to achieve? I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on unto perfection he says therefore what did he say therefore he's been speaking to these hebrew believers and these hebrew christians were perpetual babies they were perpetual children and their lives showed to the apostle that they ought to leave the baby stage of Christianity. They ought to leave the childhood or childish stage of the Christian faith. Put it this way. They ought to leave the carnality of the world encroaching upon the Christian life and move on. That's why he uses the word, therefore, if you look at chapter 5, it says in verse 12, For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers, ye ought to be masters, ye ought to be models, examples, perfect example, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the false principles of the oracles of God. And have become such a sub need of milk, of the rudiments, of motivation, of entertainment, of propping you up every time. That instead of becoming solid, steadfast, and strong in your faith, you're always looking for something exciting. Something entertaining, something that is just motivational, like the milk of the world. But it says, now move on. It says, you have, you have need of strong meat. But looks like since you became a convert, a believer, a Christian, supposed to be a disciple, you still and not bear the strong meat. It says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word. It's a novice in the word. In the word of righteousness. Because he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age. Even those by who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That is, those who are so mature, 
that they can discern this is right, that is wrong. This is appropriate, this is inappropriate. This is acceptable, that is unacceptable. This leads to glory, that leads to doom. That as you grow and mature, and the word of God dwells in you, abides in you, saturates you. And the spirit of God envelops you, enlightens you, and empowers you. It makes you to become an adult, adult believer, matured believer. That's why after saying that, he now says, therefore, let's leave all that. All this babyish approach. All this childish attitude, all this carnal behavior, and all the experiences that are shaky, that you cannot really talk about or tell about, therefore, living the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. I'm talking to you today on pressing on to perfection. Pressing on. You stay idle, you're not pressing on. You stay kind of static, you're not pressing on. You fold your arms and sit back. Praise the Lord, I'll be Christian, amazing grace. How sweet the sound, sitting or standing in one place, stationary. You are not pressing on. He says, therefore, leave all that behind and let us press on unto perfection. Move on unto perfection. Go on unto perfection. Hold on. If you're taking a journey and you're moving on from this place to that place, first of all, you need to get up. And you need to be set in motion. Not only that you are set in motion, you are set in motion in the right direction. That's where I'm going. That's the destination. That is the goal. And because you know where you are going, you are able to move on in the right direction and never go get, and you get there. But... If you don't know where you are going, or you are afraid of where you are going, where you are supposed to go, you might just be like the children of Israel, doing some merry-go-round. You are active, but you are not progressive. You are praying, but you are not perfected. You seem to be very up and doing, but it's yielding no result. Therefore, you should understand, what is this place we are going? When it says, let us move on, let us go on, and let us press on to perfection. For you to understand our goal, for you to understand our destination, for you to understand where we're going, perfection, perfection. I want to explain to you the goal, the destiny, the destination, perfect. And I use the letters of, the, of that word, perfect, so that you will understand. Because there are people that, they don't even think about, let us move on to perfection. It's like the word perfection is only in heaven. It's only with the angels. It's only with God. It's only with the Trinity. That God is perfect, that we know. Jesus lived a perfect life here, that we know. And the Holy Ghost is perfect. That for them, for their understanding, that's where perfection starts. But for you to know that this is a realizable goal. Not only that, this is a recommended goal. Not only that, this is a goal that the Lord wants to take your hand and says, Come on now, leave all that behind. Repenting every day. Leave all that behind. I'm sorry, I've gone into that thing again. Every day it says, leave all that behind and let us go on to perfection. What's that perfection? The word perfect. P, purified, 
by the sanctifier. You see, when you become saved, you become born again, you are now a child of God. But there's something inside your heart. It's called the root of sin. It's called the Adamic nature. In sin was I born. In sin did my mother conceive me. It's right there. It says they speak lies as soon as they are born. But that thing that is inside you will create problem for you if it is not dealt with. That's why you come back again to the cross. And then he takes the blood of the Lamb, purifying their hearts by faith. So be there, purified by the sanctifier. That's the perfection the if there is that you are emptied of self. You want to be like Jesus Christ. And how do you become like Jesus Christ? He said, I do nothing of myself. He said, as my father has taught me, so I do. And when you lift up the son of man, then will you know there is nothing of self here. And when in your life, you come to the cross. You get to the cross. You are purified by the sanctifier. You are emptied of self. Self-praise. Self-recognition. Self-propaganda. Self-promotion. Everything revolving around self. Another word for that is ego. Ego. E. G-O. If you break it up, it means edging God out. It's me. It's I. My barn. My store. My harvest. My talent. My glory. My will. They edge God out. But when you come to the cross... That ego is crushed, that ego is cancelled, and you are emptied of self. When there is nothing of self, and you are completely free from that self-centered life. That's the perfection he's talking about. P, to be purified by the sanctifier. E, is to be emptied of self. R, is to be redeemed redeemed from all sin, that he gave himself for us, that he might purify a peculiar people unto himself, redeemed from all iniquity, and then was zealous of good works. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. It is that redemption. He came from heaven so that he will come to this earth. He knew you are surrounded by sin, the thought of sin, the life of sin, the planning of sin. Everything is sinful. But then he comes, it's like we're sold into the market of sin and we're tied down. It's like the devil wants to sacrifice us with that cord of iniquity. But now Christ came. And is the Savior. Not only the Savior, is a sanctifier. Not only the sanctifier, is the final sacrifice. And it says, my sacrifice will redeem you. And he redeems us from all sin. When we say redeem us from all sin, number one, external sin when we're saved. Number two, internal sin when we're sanctified. Purified by the sanctifier, emptied of self, and redeemed from all sin. That's perfection. The F there is that he frees us. He frees us from all slavery. Slavery and bondage. You see, there are people that are enslaved to material things. Some people are enslaved to money. That's why it says, covetousness is idolatry. And that's why that man ran to Jesus and kneeled down. And he said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. Anyway, for you to get to that kingdom, you know the commandments. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
and thou shalt not be false witness, and thou shalt not commit anything belonging to your neighbor. All this I have done from my birth. Watch lack I yet. He was the one that has the question. He wants to get to life eternal. And what do I lack yet? If you will be perfect, go sell what you have because you are enslaved to money. You are enslaved to your property. You are enslaved to material things. Material things have become your God. It is all right to own money. But when money owns you, you are a slave. And what we're talking about, the destination we're going, is that he wants to set you free from slavery. That you're not enslaved to money. You're not enslaved to the world. You're not enslaved to the works of the flesh. You are free and free indeed. That's perfection purified by the Savior. And teach of self, redeemed from all sin, redeemed from all sin, and freed from all slavery. But then it's not only that you are established in sanctification. There are people that they get saved on a Sunday, by Wednesday, they're not sure again. They're not established in sanctification. They're not established in holiness. I thought I was free from anger. What's this thing coming up again? I thought I was free from this internal jealousy and internal envy. What's this coming again? I thought I was free completely from this internal pride, trying to raise his ugly head. What's this again? I thought I was free from this carnal competition. That competes with other people. You go this way. I'm trying to go a mile extra. Not because I want to glorify God. because, But because I want to show. I can go farther than him. I can do more than him. I'm better than him. I thought I was free from that. They are not established in sanctification. But what's perfection? When the Lord purifies you. The sanctifier purifies you. And you are emptied of self. And you are redeemed from all sin. And you are freed from slavery. And you are now established in sanctification. Not only that, see, you are consecrated to his sovereignty. Consecrated unto his sovereignty. That's all. You never disagree with God. You are always in agreement with God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. If you're going to walk with God, you agree with his sovereignty. You are totally consecrated and committed to his sovereignty. You may not be thinking this is the way to go, but he says this is the way to go. Lord, I agree. Thy will be done. He says this is what I want of you. Lord, thy will be done. To go or to stay. To speak or to be silent. Lord, I agree. Whatever your will is, I am consecrated and committed to your sovereignty. A person that never disagrees with God. A person that is walking with God. That's another Enoch. That he walked with God 300 years and then we are told he was not found because God took him. For before his translation, we have this record about him that he pleased God. This is my beloved son. This is the beloved soul. This is the beloved saint in whom I am well pleased. He is consecrated to divine sovereignty. And then she is transformed into a saint. Is transformed into a saint. Is now saintly. The thoughts are saintly. The mind saintly. The life saintly. That's where we're going. Pressing on to perfection. And here the Lord is telling us this is perfection. He wants to purify you because he is a sanctifier. He wants to empty you of self. 
And he wants to completely redeem you from all kinds of sin, internal and external. He wants to set you free from every form of slavery. You're not enslaved to anything. If God says, drop this, thank you, Jesus is gone. You, lose, you, you hold everything with a loose hand. There is nothing that is so important to you on earth. You say, God, how can that be? How can I leave that? I want to hold on to it. You're a slave to that thing, you know. If you cannot drop it, you might be an Abraham, and you're enslaved to Isaac. You cannot give it up. And if anything happens to you at all, is that your whole world has crumbled. And that's something that happens to people when they're enslaved. You might be enslaved to a man, enslaved to a woman, enslaved to money, enslaved to maybe drink, enslaved to whatever it is. And when the Lord says, here is what I require of you, that that sin will live your life, you'll, you, you drop that sin. You see, that means then I cannot be a Christian. That means then I cannot remain in this place. You might be enslaved to position. That if you don't have that position, you say, that's why I'm here. I must be. No, you uh, just, just say, Lord, thy will be done. You're a slave to be in a state of us here. And if that one is not there, uh -huh, what am I doing here? What, you need, what, you're doing, what are you doing here? You are here to get to heaven. You're a slave to becoming a general superintendent. Uh -uh. That's idolatry. You hold that sin in your mind so long, it becomes the sin you worship. That's why I'm there. No, you are not enslaved to that. When you are sanctified, when you are perfected, it frees you from every form of idolatry. And then you are established in sanctification, established in holiness, and you are consecrated, committed completely Unto his sovereignty, and you are transformed to being a saint. If that is the goal, perfection, it says now, let us press on unto perfection, leaving all those principles, all those rudiments, leaving all that behind. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, pursuing gracious perfection. Pursuing gracious perfection. What that means is that the perfection we pursue is the one that comes by grace. The perfection we pursue is not the one we're trying by ourselves. Not only that, we're not, we're not uh, pursuing uh, creative uh, or created perfection. We're not pursuing it, that make perfection. Because we're not Adam. We're different from Adam. Why? Adam has only one other person on earth, his wife. No neighbor, no enemy, no friend, no servants, no in-law, nobody else. And so his situation is totally, completely different from our situation. Adam did not have the original sin. He was created to be in the likeness of God. Your situation is totally different from that of Adam. We're not pursuing angelic perfection. There are some people that say they can never be perfect. You know why they say that? They think we're talking about angelic per perfection. Uh-uh. You don't have angelic perfection. Angels don't have Satan tempting them. Angels don't have political position thrown to them as a carrot, as carrot that they want to either grab or reject. Angels don't have traditions of men. Angels don't have all the things that surround us. Their own kind of perfection is totally different. You are not pursuing angelic perfection. You are pursuing the perfection that is made available by grace, gracious perfection. That's why point number one is pursuing gracious perfection. Number two, preparing and praying for gospel perfection. Not the perfection of the law. 
the perfection of the gospel as Christ has now come. Good news, joy to all the earth that now we have the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What can that gospel do in my life? What can that gospel produce in my life? How far can that gospel take me near to God? That's what you are talking about. Gospel perfection. Preparing for that. And praying for that. Point number three. Possessing and preserving glorious perfection. The kind of perfection God requires, not the one you require, not the one I require. The kind of perfection God requires to take us to glory. That the glory that was given me, I give unto them, that they may be with me and live with me where I am. That's the, that's the perfection we're talking about. The one that takes us to glory. And we want to possess that, and we want to pursue that, and we want to preserve that. Point number one, pursuing gracious perfection. Pursuing gracious perfection. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. It says... We need to leave something behind. We want to leave some things behind. And it's very clear. Number one, the milk that we're attached to. The motivational messages we like to hear. The same repetition of God will heal you. God will provide for you. God will give you money. God will make you to just... Uh, be the number one in your school and number one in your college and number one in your place. Praise the Lord. Today, there's a great service. That's baby milk message. God will heal your body and is going to help you be strong. As strong as Samson. You will run from here to there. My friend, that is baby message. The milk that all those things that minister to the flesh and to the body, it says, can we leave that behind now? We've talked about that for 30 years, 40 years. We should be moving on now to perfection. Not only that, he talks about this in verse 1. This is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. It says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That we're still talking about repentance, repentance, repentance. After how many years now? We've repented already. Settle that. And say, praise the Lord. That is settled. And move on. And then it goes on to say, and the faith towards God. Faith. Jericho was falling down. Faith. That will heal your body. The faith of Abraham. You will have children. If you've been barren for seven years, 17 years, doesn't matter. We can have faith today. And the people shout, praise the Lord. He said, can we leave that behind now? I move on. There's something more than faith for healing. I'm faith to turn barrenness to a childbearing. I'm faith for money. I'm faith for prosperity. We can leave all that behind now. Some people, that is why they spend every message, every Sunday, every day of their lives, prosperity, some daily Bible reading. That's all they emphasize every time. God will do this. God will do this. And all the texts they are sending to you, and they are saying that, you know, if you want this text to be sent to you, uh, throw this uh, network Work, you will, uh, you know, register this and, you know, punch this and all that. And this will come to you every day so that you cannot the face that achieves. We can afford to leave all that behind now and let us move on to perfection. We'll be too much on this side of give me this and get me that and hold this for me and all that. Then it goes on to say of the doctrine of baptisms. That is water baptism. 
that is evil spirit baptism. All the baptism. Have you not have you not been baptized in water? Well, we flog in that matter again every time. It says, leave all that behind and of the laying on of hands. If you travel like I travel, and you go through the airport, you find people, immediately you arrive, and they, oh, pastor, pastor, so and so, they put their head like this, lay hands on me, lay hands on me. When you say, God bless you, you say, no, pastor, that's not enough, lay hands on me, lay hands on me. And we people who are here too, looks like, you know, laying on of hands, lay hands on me, lay hands on me, lay hands on me. He said, can we leave all that behind now? The people don't understand. They do not understand. There's something higher. There's something greater that we need to press on to perfection. That will leave all these uh, rudimentary things and primary school uh, matters of Christianity. Leave them behind and move on. And it, then it says, son of the resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead, uh, we put that into two parts. Number one, the resuscitation of the dead, and later the resurrection of the dead. And there are some people, they will never let go. They never let go. They never let go. If, uh, you know, sometimes you hear about uh, somebody's uh, wife has died, and uh, after the wife died, and then you are thinking of the time of the burial, because she was a believer, and she's gone to be with the Lord. They say, no, I don't accept. And for one month, the wife is still there, not buried. Two months, three months, brother, what's happening? When are you going to bury the, uh, your wife? Oh, he says, I don't accept, Pastor. She's not dead. She's not dead. You mean that you're so selfish that your wife has gone to heaven and you will not let her remain in heaven. You want her to come back here to the place of sorrow and the place of tears and the place of temptation and trial. She is now free and she is with the Lord. You know that she was born again. She was a child of God. She is now in heaven. But pastor, pastor, it's a great, great loss. And nobody will ever feel the vacuum. That selfishness, my friend. Let her go. She has been enjoying the presence of the Lord for the past three months. Even if you pray, she will not come back. I said she will not come back. They will not let go. They, they, they say, Pastor, lay hands on her. We hear all these things that are happening. But I'm not willing to do that, you know. I'm not willing to take her away, to bring her back to all the trials, all the temptations, and all the tears, and all the cooking, and facing the charcoal in the kitchen. There's no charcoal where he, she is. In the street of gold. And then if she finds me praying for her to come back to you. To come back to your arguments. And come back to all the palaver in the house. And say, Pastor, I thought you were spiritual. You want to bring me back to this man. Talk to him so that he can prepare to meet me up there. That's why I'm talking to you today. I said, well, that's why I'm talking to you today. You see, but you see, the people, that, that's what they want. And if they hear that there's an evangelist, there's a preacher somewhere, and he's raising the dead, they say, can I go for my mother who died in my mortuary now? Because I want my mother back. How old was your mother when your mother died? 90 years of age. And before she died, how was her waist? Pain every time. Her eyes dim. And then her ability to eat, Pastor, that was difficult. You want to bring her back to that same condition? Now, don't be selfish. Release her and let her go. Are you there? I said, release her and let her go. And you, after you've done that, and we leave all these things, then we move on. We move on to perfection, pursuing gracious perfection. Actually, that's what the Lord told Abraham. That's what he wanted. And God still remains today as he was yesterday. I'm looking at Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. And I'm reading here from verse 1. Genesis chapter 17 verse 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God. 
walk before me, tell me. And be thou perfect. Now, if you say it's not possible to be perfect, you accuse God of asking for what he knows to be impossible. You count God as a taskmaster. You count God like Pharaoh, who will say, you must make the same number of bricks or blocks, but I will not give you straw. I will not give you strength. I will not give you grace. I will not give you any kind of help to do it. And I know you cannot even do it, but I'm going to require it of you. What kind of God will that be? Of course, it's possible. And God required from him that he will be perfect. That's why after he had been following the Lord for more than 24 years, 99 minus 75, 24 years, he still said, Abraham, you know what I'm waiting for? I want the ups and downs to come to an end. I want, uh, you know, the kind of talk you are talking to the king of Gerah. She is my sister. Let that stop. I want all this thing to have self-management. That I said, I promised you this. And then you go to the backyard and you go to Hagar. I want that to stop. I want you to walk before me. Don't walk behind me. Don't hide your walk from me. Walk before me and be the perfect. I want to see you the way you walk transparent, transformed, definite, that you're walking unashamedly with the Lord. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, he had spoken to Abraham, the father of the Jews, of the Israelites. Now he comes to speak to the Israelites themselves. He tells us in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse, uh, verse, I'm reading from verse 13. In verse 13, here is what God said to the children. He said, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. With the Lord thy God. With the Lord thy God. He is thy God. He knows you. You know him. He has called you. You have responded. But now as a walk with him, children of Israel, thou shalt be perfect. He required that from the men. He required that from the women. He required that from everyone that he had called out of Egypt. Thou shalt be perfect with thy God. Job chapter 1. We're reading from verse 8. Job chapter 1, reading from verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, as thou considered my servant Job, here God was bragging on Job. And he said, he is mine. He has relationship with me, number one. He has fellowship with me, number two. And he has faithfulness towards me, number three. That this Job, he was a man that walked. The Bible had not been fully written. He didn't have a pastor. He didn't have an encourager. He didn't have someone to be propping him up every time, encouraging him, exhorting him, advising him, counseling him. Job, you can try. Job, you can try. You can try him up. No, but personally by himself. You see, we have turned the Christianity into a kind of a comrade community thing. And I'm waiting. It's like even if you have the food on the table, you can't eat. Why are you not eating, my friend? I want to see the love of the people of the church that they will come and help me pick up the spoon, help me pick up the knife and put the food in my mouth. We can't do anything for ourselves anymore. We can't pray for ourselves. 
We can't read the Bible ourselves. We can't encourage ourselves. We can't counsel ourselves. We can't say, I'm getting up. I'm moving on. And we can't even do restitution by ourselves. You, you stole money from another person, and the Lord is saying, Make right your way. Yes, Lord, I know I will do it, but I'm waiting to see the GS. What are waiting to see the GS for? Because my coordinator told me, my pastor told me, every form of, every form of um, restitution, you must see the GS. Where do you read that in the Bible? You cannot do anything for self anymore. Zacchaeus did not wait for Peter. Zacchaeus did not wait for Philip or anybody. He said, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything, my wrong accusation from any man, I restore him fourfold. Here is Job without any counselor, without any advisor. The Spirit of God ministering to him. And he following the Spirit of God, and God said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? It was not a copycat. It was not like so and so is doing it. Why don't I? If so and so is permitted to do that, why not I? I went to a place. And I saw there is a member of Deeper Life. And she is accepted as a member of Deeper Life. And when I watched very well, she had a little earrings. And she had this and that. If she is doing that, why can't I? Who is holding you? You can do whatever you want to do. And demonstrate who you are. And show who you are. If that is your model. If that is your example. Good luck. For you, we are going to heaven here. Any candidate for heaven there? Of course. In that other church, their pastor encourages them. And he makes an announcement. He gives cars to their head usher. And since you know that's what he do, what are you doing here? Why don't you go there and get your own car? Here, we don't give cars to ushers or singers or workers. Here, we tell people everything you have, your strength, your talent, your ability belongs to God. Give unto the Lord the best thing that you have. That's what we teach here. And if you're looking for where they, you know, buy cars for this and buy this for that, during the end of the year, if you see what it do in that church and then they send all these uh, what do they call them hampers or whatever hampers hangers handers whatever they, they, they send to everybody and you know our church here only bible what else do you want our church here only holiness what else do you want a person that is uh, you know giving everything is god to prepare you for heaven or the other fellow that is get, bringing, bringing you all this that wants your heart to be totally riveted and pivoted and glued to this world i want to prepare you for heaven that's all i'm going to do and the rest god will do for you yeah. and so job there was nobody like him. He wasn't copying anybody. But here is where we're going. A perfect and an upright man. One that feareth God and is choice evil. Perfect. You will be perfect. You see Job there. He didn't copy anybody. He didn't wait for anybody. The perfection was there. Pursuing gracious perfection that you are pressing on to perfection look at chapter 2 chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 3 chapter 2 we're looking at verse 3 here it says and the lord said unto satan as thou considered my servant job that there is none like him in the earth a perfect and an upright man a perfect a perfect a perfect and an upright man now you know that perfection we're not talking of angelic perfection and we're not even talking about mental perfection look up here there is mental perfection. We don't have that. There is moral perfection. That's what he wants us to have. Mental perfection is when you know everything that God knows. Job did not have 
mental affection. He did not know that all these boils came from Satan. He did not know that the fire that fell from heaven and destroyed his farm, he didn't know that that came from Satan. He didn't know that all the Serbians that went and destroyed all his property, he didn't know that that came from Satan. But his Satan that went and did all that, he did not know that. He was not om omniscient, knowing all things. He did not have mental perfection, but he had moral perfection that, that's all god requires from you you won't know everything and you won't uh, be able to even understand everything when we're, we're sanctified we're purified and give the bible to that sanctified brother that sanctified sister and tell him tell him or tell her to explain to you uh, the chapter six or chapter seven of revelation and he reads all that he said uh, pastor i can't understand but to say you are sanctified, yes, sir, I am. Moral perfection, not mental perfection. And so there are people that say, okay, if you say you are perfect, then they ask us a question of uh, what took place a thousand years ago in uh, ancient history. And I say, well, I don't understand that. If you don't know all things, how do you say you are perfect? Well, it's not mental perfection, it is moral perfection. That's what it requires, and that's what we are pursuing. You are going to have it. I said you are going to have it. That's why it goes on to say that he's still perfect and upright, upright man, one that feareth God and is choice evil, and still he holdeth fast. Is integrity, although thou moved me against him to destroy him without a cause. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He's saying that perfection he wants us to have, will have it. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And you'll find the word perfection in all these passages I'm reading to you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you, tell me, make me, read that for yourself now, from make, make me, perfect in every good work to do his will that's perfection that you know his will and you say yes lord i'll do it i don't think i have all the strength but i'll start and when i start you will help me through he wants you to do something maybe you also say a word to somebody you say lord i'm afraid of that person to say the word but because you told me to say it I'm going to start. I will open my mouth. You'll fill my mouth. You'll complete it for me. That's the perfection requires. That once you know his will, there's the willingness to do his will. And there is the eagerness to do his will. And there is the faithfulness that you want to do his will. And it says through that blood of the everlasting covenant, it will cleanse you. It will wash you. It will purge you. And then it will make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Walking in you is gracious. It's the one walking in you. It's not you just trying by yourself and just struggling all by yourself. If you go to God in prayer, Lord, you demand gracious perfection from me. The perfection that is worked out, the perfection that is effected, and the perfection that is produced by your grace. And you go to God, he will do it for you. I said he will do it for you. Walk in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Point number two now preparing and praying for gospel perfection. Now, if you didn't know something is possible, how do you prepare yourself? If you've never heard about it, how do you prepare yourself? If you do not know the importance of this, how do you prepare yourself? All you'll be doing is you'll be making excuses every time. When something happens, I will say, ah, ah, 
brother. This has happened again. Uh, Pastor, you understand? Nobody is perfect. Which Bible are you reading? Nobody is perfect. Job was perfect. Which Bible are you reading? Nobody is perfect. Enoch was perfect. Nobody is perfect. How do you know that? You must be perfect. He requires that. Cancel that excuse from your mouth. That he wants you to move on. He wants you to march forward. He wants you to go on unto perfection. And you tie yourself down every time. Nobody is perfect. That's why you're not preparing for that perfection. You'll prepare. You will pray. And that perfection, the Lord, will effect in your life in Jesus' name. Let me remind you once again the goal. If you don't know where you're going, you'll not know where you reach there. If you don't know where you're going, you will not know how to prepare for that journey to reach there. Perfect. That means purified by the sanctifier. Perfect. That means emptied of self. Nothing of self. Nothing of self. All of you and nothing of me are is to be redeemed from all sin. He redeems us from all sin, external and internal. And F is to be freed, completely free from slavery. You are not uh, you know, enslaved to anything or anyone. There's no attachment that is so much in your life that you cannot give it up if the Lord requires it. And then E, you establish the sanctification. C, you are committed and consecrated to, the, to his sovereignty. And T, you are transformed into a saint. It will happen. Preparing and praying for gospel perfection. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 2. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. It says in verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. You see that? There are people that uh, give you the idea that, uh, well, God doesn't even expect me to be perfect anyway. So why should I try? But here it says, I've not found your work to be perfect. Get up, be watchful, and do something so that you'll be perfect before me. He expects it. He wants it. He requires it. And he says, you prepare yourself, and you do something what ought to be done. We're looking at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, I read here from verse 21, Psalm 139, verse 21. It says, Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? I am, am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with what kind of hatred? Perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. What the psalmist is saying here is, I love what God loves. I hate what God hates. I love the people God loves, and I hate the people he hates. And David was saying, now, before you copy me, you must find out the reason why I do what I do. There are people that will say, you know, I'm following the Bible. I say, how? He said, look at those people in the Bible. They conquered all the people in Jericho and they destroyed the Amalekites. You know what? The Amalekites were enemies of God. And they were rigid they were firm in their hatred. And their cup of iniquity had run over. And God said, those are my enemies. Joshua, go fight them. 
He has not given you that commandment. It is a deep, it's a ministry for Joshua. It's not what he loved to do, what he liked to do. These are people that hate me and I hate them. Audible voice of God. I raised you up, exterminate and wipe out my enemies. And the psalmist says, I hate the people God hates. You are not like that. Now he has given you a commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at the story of the Samaritan. And then the good Samaritan came and he picked him up. Why didn't he kill him? He doesn't have commandment to kill, to destroy. That's not his enemy. That day is past. That age is past. You find David coming to the battlefield. And here David comes and he sees Goliath. And Goliath is saying, I defy the God of Israel. He made himself an enemy of God. And he said, choose one person here, and here am I. If he fights against me and he wins, if he conquers me, then you conquer us. And when David came, David did not say, you offended me. You spoke against me. You insulted me. I'm going to fight you. And I'm going to destroy you. You are my enemy. No. He said, I come in the name of the Lord because you defied the God of Israel. You made yourself an established enemy, an institutionalized enemy of the Almighty God. And I hate what God hates. I love what God loves. And it says, I hate that with perfect hatred. Anything God hates, now he doesn't hate the world now because he so loved the world. There's a different generation. There's a different dispensation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What does he hate now? He hates lying now. He hates hypocrisy now. He hates discord now. He hates knocking the head of the husband to the wife and knocking the head of the wife of the husband. He hates separating friends. He hates the things that injure people. And then what perfection are you talking about now? He wants you to have a perfect hatred for the sin that he hates. That's all. That's a perfection. And he's saying, prepare yourself for that. That's why he goes on now to say, in verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Know my heart. And try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me that makes me less than perfect. See, examine me. If there's anything less than perfection in me, lead me in the way everlasting. He will answer that prayer for you. Because that is what he wants. He wants you to find out and to check up anything in your life that makes you less than perfect. Anything in your life that makes you not the person you ought to be. I'm looking at Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. You have listened to our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumuye. And I believe the word will dwell in your heart. In Jesus' name, let us pray. Our mighty Father, we thank you, Lord, because of the message you have given to us this afternoon. I pray by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ for every year that I'm listening to the word, it will be fruitful in their life in Jesus' name. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, every one of us, and dwell with you in the kingdom of God and the last day. Thank you, O Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.